She just arrived an hour ago, and she's going to transit there to 3 a.m. tomorrow morning. And um, she was supposed to come back on Tuesday, but there was one big evangelistic event on Friday night, and those, the other peers, colleagues, this is the Gen Z youth leaders, between the ages of 17 and 24 from mostly North America and South Africa, who are having a conference uh, equipping session in Manchester with an evangelistic event in London. And um, they said, look, you need to extend your trip. We will help cover the, the difference. Um, and thank God we had two days of holiday, so she didn't miss too much of school. But she and Catherine are flying back 3 a.m. tomorrow to KL. So it's a long, it's a 36 hour trip. And, um, and she sent us two very short videos. One was a quick scan of Buckingham Palace. And the other more exciting to her was, this is the bridge where Spider-Man and Mysterio fall. Oh, okay. <laughs> we happen to see Spider-Man comes home, but, um, but it was a wonderful time of and connecting with, with youth leaders to reach out to their own age group. You know, some of the most influential people in our lives are those our peers, especially for students, for young adults, high school and college students. Um, so we we're glad for this privilege that was opened up to her, where 90% of the cost was, was sponsored, was taken care of, and um, she could make the trip. So that's for that. And, um, and I, was, I was encouraged when Marcus opened in prayer this morning. He kind of prayed one of my key verses for this morning, uh, which has to do with our uh, theme for, actually it's a, it should be a theme for our life, but we are, we are focusing on it this, this year. Um, kind of coming back to basics, to foundations, which is the love of God. Amen? So, knowing His love, the power of His love, the importance of His love, and how His love can and should impact our lives every day. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for each one here that You brought this morning. We thank You for Your grace upon us. We thank You for bringing us through this past week, this month of January, this past year, and pandemic years, Lord, with all the shaking. We thank You for Your age of protection. We thank you, Lord, for those that, that you brought through the COVID, that you healed. We thank you for, for those, Lord, that, that lost loved ones. We pray for their peace and comfort, Father, for many have lost loved ones in, in the past two, three years. Lord, we just thank you for the gift of salvation, for life, abundant life, for health and strength, for peace in this nation, in, the, in Penang. We thank you for the freedom to come together and worship you in this Muslim nation, Lord. We just thank you for our loved ones, our family and friends, and for the grace on our lives. We glorify you. May your word go forth this morning and not return to you void, but accomplish what you please and prosper the reason for which you sent it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If I say the word love, I don't know what comes to your mind. You know, it's a, it's a very deep word that we have kind of minimized because of media, because of movies, entertainment. Love, the word love is thrown around for us so many, in so many ways, you know. We as I often say we use the word to say, you know, I love my friend, I love food, I love ice cream, I love my dog, I love holidays, I love God. And we use the same word for many things, but even in the Greek, there are different words for love. And we don't realize that God is defined by one of those particular words. And I think you all know what that word is. It starts with an A. You know what's the word for love in Greek? It is agape. Right? It's agape love. And that defines the God kind of love. So whenever you hear the phrase, you know, love is the greatest, what you're saying is agape is the greatest. God is love, you're saying God is agape. And, um, and what is unique about agape is it, is, it is not self at the center. You know, many times what we think we're doing is loving really is because we want something back or we're expecting something back. There's some self-interest at the center of it, but that's not the agape love. Agape really has nothing to gain but everything to give, to bless. Someone said the difference between love, agape and lust is um, agape is giving at personal expense, whereas last is getting at another's expense. And, um, and so agape really defines God's love. It has really nothing to do with feeling like loving. Okay, we all know the greatest act of love Jesus did was on the cross. And there was absolutely nothing to do about feeling like going through what he did. All, right, all the pain and suffering, if you see Mel Gibson's Passion, there's nothing about feeling like doing that. He did it out of self-sacrificing, Look, it was a choice in submission of love for his father. He humbled himself, he became obedient to the point of death. And so unlike human love, unlike all the other loves, you know, we have filio, that's another Greek word, which means brotherly love, which is where we get the state of, of uh, Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. 
And another word for agape in English is charity. So you want to stay in, if, if you're called charity and you don't know where to live in America, go to Philadelphia. <laughs> you know, charity, love, agape love. In fact, that's a, it's a whole series of, you know, add to your but add to brotherly love, charity. It's a whole, it's a whole steps, you know, that's why we're going to find out that love is not something you just walk in. It's really an end result of being a disciple. It's something you've got to learn how to do. It doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come automatically. Um, it's, it's part of becoming more like Christ. So, we all know, I say, what comes to mind when, when, when you think about why is love so important? Many of you will remember the greatest commandment, right? This is when he would often ask the disciples, or the religious leaders would ask, what is the greatest commandment? We would say, well, it is loving the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, you know, loving your neighbors yourself. And on these two hang all the law and the prophets. And, uh, and then Jesus said in the New Testament, a new commandment I give you. A new one. And the purpose of the new one is not so much to cancel the old one, but to fulfill the old one. And what's the new one? The new commandment I give you that you love one another, not just your neighbor, as I have loved you, not as yourself. So that's the big difference. The new commandment is, the old was love God, um, with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But the new is, love one another as the Lord loves us. And guess what? When we love one another, we are loving God. So God says, you can't love me if you really don't love one another. So we are kind of fulfilling the greatest to the new. Right? And 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, And now remains faith, hope, agape, these three, but the greatest of these is love, is agape. Why is it the greatest? Well, the Bible tells us, God is love. 1 John 4, 8 says, the second part of it is, God is agape. So God is defined. He is the word. He is agape. So if God is the greatest, love is the greatest. His kind of love is the greatest. Right? So I'm going to look at the three or four, three keys of the importance of the God kind of love and what are some of the blockers Blessing blockers of receiving is love. You know, the challenge for you and me, for every Christian is, is trying to love God and love others without knowing how much He loves us. And it's almost impossible. And that was kind of like the purpose of the law, to show you how impossible it is to love God or anyone else without knowing how much He loves you and me. Um, and I think this is best demonstrated by Peter and contrasted with John, the two disciples of Jesus. Peter was striving and struggling very hard to show that he had such great love for the Lord. In fact, he would brag about it, he would boast about it. You know, Lord, I would never leave you. And we all know what happened. Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. But John never boasted about how much he loved the Lord. But John always kind of boasted about how much he was loved by God. Every time you see John's name in the Gospels, you would say, the disciple who Jesus loved. Peter was saying, I'm the disciple who loves Jesus. But John would say, hey, I'm John, the one, the, the disciple whom Jesus loves, the beloved. So there was a huge contrast. And I believe that this is one reason why John was the only one who stood faithful to the end and was not afraid. Remember when Jesus was arrested and betrayed, all the disciples ran away out of fear except for John. And you notice where John would sit every time it's mentioned that the disciples were around Jesus? He was closest to the Lord. He had no fear. You know, not a, sometimes, you know, we like to leave some space. You know, some comfort space, you know, you have to have a, a, a safety space. But the Lord, uh, John was not just sitting beside Jesus, he was leaning on Jesus. Now Jesus had a lot of love, you know, I'm sure it's very uncomfortable, there's no AC, kind of hot. You know, he had this guy leaning on you, it's like you're probably perspiring and, and I don't think it was very comfortable. But John was not afraid of being close to the Lord, because there is no fear in intimacy. And so John knew how much he was loved. And so this morning we want to learn about how we, you and I can grow in the knowledge of God's love for us. Why? For some very important reasons. Obviously, number one is so that we can love Him back and so that we can love others. Because freely we have received, freely we can give. If we don't know how much we are loved, we can't love one another. It's very hard. Okay, so why is love so important, the agape love? Why is, it, why is it foundational? Firstly, number one, it is how you and I are known as Believers, as Christians, as God's children, we are known by our fruit. So God recognizes us by our love because if God is love and we are His, we must reflect and resemble something of Him. The most important part of Him is just His love. 
you know, Matthew 7 talks about, um, you know, you're, you're, many will say they do lots of things in His name, miracles and prophecies and all that. And they'll say, I don't know you. It says, by your fruit you shall be known. So we are not recognized as Christians because of all our good works alone, or because we can do many miracles alone, but primarily because we are like Christ, in that we love. Not only are we known by God, so that's the, that's the difference between the world and the church. Because non-Christians, non-believers can counterfeit miracles. The Egyptian magicians said that. Right? The magicians of Egypt, up to a point, counterfeited the miracles of Moses. They dropped their, their staffs and they became snakes and Moses they ate up their snakes. So there's a point where power can be counterfeited, but you can't counterfeit fruit. Right? Because fruit is a product of relationship between the seed and the soil and the roots. Whereas gifts are independent of relationship. You can hang a, a gift on a Christmas tree. Doesn't mean that the, the tree actually bore those gifts. Because Ro, um, I think it's Romans says, the gifts of God are without repentance. It's a sovereignty. He gives each one different gifts and talents and strengths. Right? So we are known by our fruit. So it is possible to do a lot of good works. It's possible to do many miracles and not be known if there is zero life, zero love in our hearts. In other words, you know, you can do a lot of good works, you can do a lot of miracles, but have a lot of anger, hatred, unforgiveness, bitterness, uh, envy, jealousy. And God says, I don't know who you are, where are you from? You're nothing like me. And that's why good works cannot save us. You know, doing a good work, and many non-Christians, especially of a particular faith, they try to earn their way to heaven by their good works, hoping that they will end up being more good than bad. Hoping that all their good works would kind of compensate for what's not good about their lives. But they don't realize that no amount of good work can make us good. <coughs> doing a good work and doing good things doesn't give us a good heart. Because you can do a good thing for the a bad reason. You can, do one, you, can, you can be a blessing for wrong motives. Or your own personal reputation to be, to be known as, wow, you're such a good person. That's why you see many people give, why? Because the name's on the wall. So and so donated so much for this building or whatever. If the name was not going to be in the wall, they probably wouldn't give a cent. Right? So, so that's why the Lord says, hey, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Okay, so that you don't give for recognition, but you're doing it unto the Lord. Okay, so we are known by our fruit, by love. God recognizes His people by those who love. But not only are we known by God, but the Lord says, by this will all men know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. So not only does God recognize His people by, by His love in us, but it says, the world will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. Isn't that amazing? We think that, you know, if you're a disciple, you must be known by all your head knowledge, by, by all your degrees from seminary. Um, you know, you're a disciple because of all that you can do. You have done so many things. You have, you have done many, planted many churches and ministries. And God says, hang on, hang on. You know, people will know you're my disciples, not by what you have accomplished, not by what you can do, but by your love for one another. So at the end of the day, if we, if we accomplish lots of things, but in our hearts, there is, we are, our, our lives are marked by a lack of love. If our lives are marked by strife and, and competition and, and all the things that break up relationships, God is not impressed by all we can accomplish. He says, look, the world will know your mind because of your love for one another. Right? So that's the first importance. Why is agape so important? Because we are recognized as God because of His loveliness. And we are recognized by, as His disciples by our love for one another. Now what's the second key, or second importance of the agape love of God? It is the primary reason or, or foundation for us to be blessed for the good things we do. You know, you can turn to this well-known chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, the, the love chapter, in the month of love. February uh, 1 Corinthians 13. It says in verse so 2, okay, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2 says, Though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding in all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Isn't that amazing? Human nature tends to elevate people on the gifts. Wow, this guy is so sharp in his prophecy. He's an amazing prophet. He must be something. No, unless he has love, he's nothing. You say, wow, look at this guy. He understands all mysteries and knowledge. Look at his great faith. Wow, God must really be pleased with it. He must be something. God says, well, whether he's something or not depends on his love. 
So you can do all the things that impress man, but only God sees, and the people close to a person knows, but that is love. Here's a question, what is love? Verse 4. Well, let us, let's go to verse 3. And though I give all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now here's a key word. It profits everybody else something, but profits yourself nothing. If you look at verse 3 again. Though I give all my goods to feed the poor, so you're profiting the poor, the poor are being blessed. But without love, you're not being blessed. And though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. You wonder, why would anyone want to give their body to be burned? Why would anyone be a martyr unless they walked in love? Well, you can do the right thing for the wrong reason. And God knows uh, what, was the, what was the motivation behind you giving everything away, giving yourself to be burned. So the question now is, well, what is love? Because we would assume that the fact you're giving everything away means that must be the evidence that you love, right? The fact that you're willing to die as a martyr must be the evidence that you're full of love. But God says, no, that is not the evidence in itself. Yes, love does things. It's, faith. it's not a dead faith. It has to result in action. But here's the key. For us to profit by what we do, for us to benefit by the good that we do, for us to be blessed by the good that we do, it comes down to verse 4. Love suffers long. Right? So if we, are, if we give all our goods to the poor, but we are impatient, and love is kind, and we are unkind, love does not envy, love does not parade itself, love is not puffed up, it does not behave rudely, it does not seek its own, it is not self-seeking, it is not provoked, thinks no evil. Wow. So we do all these amazing things, but have not dealt, are not, are not dealing with these things. Doesn't mean we have arrived, none of us have arrived. We all got elements, degrees, varying degrees of these things in our lives. There may be times something will make us envious or jealous. There may be times, you know, we get a bit proud. So we got to deal with these issues every day, but we got to be aware of it because this is the foundation of whether we are blessed by the good we do. So we do amazing things. We give everything away to the poor. We have faith to move mountains. Um, you know, we have all understanding and knowledge, but we don't deal with our impatience and kindness being easily provoked. We get no blessing for all the good we do. We are nothing. Man will be impressed, men are blessed by your goodness, but we get nothing from the Lord because we're not walking in love where it counts, which is relationally. So love really, the foundation of love in action is love in relationship. So you never know whether there's love, whether you're growing in love if you're isolated and exclude yourself from people. Well, the easiest place to be a Christian is on the mountaintop by yourself. Right? No one to provoke you, no one to bother you. You'll be the most loving, patient, kind person on the planet <laughs> because you're all by yourself. Yeah, like, look, it's so important because there are a lot of people, you know the word of God says in 1 Samuel 15, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience to demonstrate God's love in your heart so that He recognizes us, so that the world will know that we are His disciples, is by how you connect, how you relate to one another. And where does charity begin? In the house. I love this, this statement, I don't know who came up with it. It says, the light that shines the furthest shines the brightest in the house. Right? The light that shines further shines brightest at home. You think of a lighthouse, right? The further the light can shine, it's brightest at the source. So this is the foundation. So why is the agape love of God so important? It's how we are known by Him. It's how the world will recognize we are his, his disciples. And it is how we are blessed for the good that we do. So yes, we are, does this mean that, oh, I, as long as I have loving relationships, I, I, you know, I'm very patient, very kind, I don't have to do any good works. No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying, look, don't save, win the whole world and lose your own soul if you replace your works with who you're becoming. See, we're called human beings, not human doings. Because our becoming is the foundation of our doing. Because it, 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 God is more interested in who we are becoming than what we do for Him. Because you don't have to be a Christian to do a good work. So lots, you know, it's hard to match unbelievers for good work, especially in Asia, with the amount of good works done by the Catholic Church and, and the Buddhists and the Taoists. They are famous for their good works, you know, especially with, with um, dialysis centers and, and helping the poor and, and they got the manpower, they got the resources. And so if it's works alone, wow, they should all be recognized. No. We are not saved by our works alone. So that's the, that's the, the second importance of agape, is we are known by God, we are known by others as the disciples, and we are blessed by what we do. So don't rob the blessing. So does that mean that you've got to be perfect to be blessed? No. You've got to be aware of your weaknesses. 
and say, Lord, help me deal with these areas. Help me overcome these areas. Okay, hopefully we are more patient today than we were last year. Hopefully we are less provoked now than we were two years ago. So hope we are, we are being changed into His likeness. What's the third and final area of the importance and power of the agape love of God? It protects us. Now this is so important. It protects us when you know your love, when you know the agape love of God in your heart, you and I will be protected from fear, insecurity and offence. We all know, right? The glue of relationship of a society is a family, is a marriage, and often the foundation of that is, is that love or not love? Right? And, and, and uh, when love breaks down, the relationship breaks. And uh, one of the reasons why we struggle to, to love is because we do not know we are loved. We're trying to earn God's love. We're trying to work for God's love. But very few of us, like John the Beloved, know how much we are loved and why we are loved. Not because we deserve it or earn it. See, the Word of God tells us, perfect love casts out fear. So if you do not know the love of the Father, you, you'll have fear in your hearts. See, John knew how much he was loved. He had no fear. He was not afraid of sitting next to Jesus. He was not afraid of reclining next to Jesus. When Jesus was arrested and betrayed, he was not afraid that he didn't run off like the other disciples. He was the only disciple at the cross. He laid down his life. He was caught, he's caught, he was arrested, but being a criminal with, a, with Jesus, he's, he's no fear. Fearless, because he knew how much he was loved. The disciple whom Jesus loved. And so knowing the Father's love will protect us from fear. So every time fear comes into our hearts, into our lives, we got to take that as an opportunity to run back to God and say, Father, remind me of your love for me. I don't have to fear this situation. I don't have to fear the circumstances. I need your peace. I know that you love me. You're my good Father. I'm your child. Give me a revelation of your love that casts out fear. And you know, fear and insecurity go hand in hand. When you're not secure, when there's fear in your life, you no longer, you no longer feel secure. When you no longer feel secure, what do you call a person who's not secure? Insecure. And when you're insecure, you react out of that fear. And insecure people often become controlling, possessive, because they're afraid of losing someone they love. So they try to control that person. And inevitably, how we pronounce the word, you end up either easily becoming offended or causing offense. So the root of being easily offended or causing offenses is a, is a love issue. You don't know why you're loved and how you're loved. And so because you don't know the love of the Father, there's a lot of fear in your life. When there's fear in your life, you become easily offended and you end up causing offense. Right? So one of the least liked promises in the Bible is Jesus said offenses will come. Okay, so you can't stop or can't help offenses from coming, but we can become less easily offended, offendable, less offendable. And that's one of my daily prayers. Say, Lord, help me be so rooted in your love that it will not be easily offended. You know, isn't it amazing that one of the descriptions of love in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7 is, that love is not provoked. Some versions say love is not easily provoked. And I wonder, you should say love that's not provoked, right? Why put the burden on the victim? You should put the burden on the offender. Love that's not provoked, right? Because so we tell everybody, hey, don't provoke, you read the Bible. If you pull out love, you shouldn't provoke me. No, no, no. The word says love is not provoked. So the burden of responsibility is more on the victim of provocation than the provoker. And this is so important because it is possible to be provoked for the wrong reason. You know that many disciples who followed Jesus were offended by what he thought. When he was teaching about the blood and, 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 and his body and his blood, you know, in, in eating his flesh and drinking his blood, some of the disciples said, this is a hard thing to understand and, and they walked off. And he looked at those who were left behind and said, are you also offended? And I think it was Peter who said, oh, where are we to go? You know, we're here, we're here with you. And so it is possible to be offended by truth. And so we are offended, if we are provoked, we got to ask ourselves, am I being provoked for the right reason? And should I be provoked? And, uh, and, and sometimes if we are not complete or fulfilled in the Father's love, we can be provoked all the time. I love the statement someone posted, you know, it says, look, um, the world is not responsible for what triggers you to always walk on eggshells around someone. In the sense that, you know, some people are just, you never know what's going to set them off. And you're always very cautious and full of fear, or better not say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, they're going to explode. Hey, that is a form of control. 
And God said, make sure that we don't become like that. And so we can't afford to allow unforgiveness to fester. And so a key, a key part of the agape love of God is not being easily provoked and forgiving. Right? Twice is mentioned in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day a daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Right? Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil for yours, the kingdom, the power, the glory. And then again, if your sins, if you forgive the sins of others, they are forgiven. So forgiveness is a huge part of the life of God flowing through us. All right? So you can't forgive without the agape love. See, why is it agape? Because it's not based on feeling. No one feels like forgiving. Forgiveness seems very unjust. You see, but that's not fair. They should pay for what they did, you know. We demand justice and God says, hey, justice is mine. Vengeance is mine. Leave it to me. You know, I'm always amazed that when Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't run to the Roman soldiers, to Pilate, to the Jews and say, ta-da, here I am, proved you wrong. I'm alive, see the scars, I was dead. He wasn't interested in vindicating himself. He went to his own. Right? And so, we need to guard our hearts from fear because there will always be things that will cause fear in our lives, uncertainty of tomorrow, fear of the future. You know, not having, not being able to control things causes fear. We are people who love to control. We are people who find security in the known, in the familiar. We hate change, right? You notice many of you have your favorite seat. You have your favorite car park. Right? You go to the same restaurant, you have your favorite table. We are creatures of heaven. We are secure in what we are familiar with. And someone said, you know, the only, only human that loves change are babies in wet diapers. Probably true. Does it change me? You know, I need a dry diaper. But by human nature, we hate change because it's uncomfortable. It makes us feel insecure. And God says, look, there are lots of things that we have no control over tomorrow, over this year ahead. What's going to happen? What, 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 this, what circumstances are going to happen? And say, Lord, I give this year to you. I give this next month to you. I commit it to you. I need your peace when, I don't, when, when things happen beyond my control, when things happen to cause fear. I choose to believe the best. That's not, that's not uh, optimism, that's faith. You know, faith and fear have something in common. They're both based on things that you can't prove, right? It, it either could happen. They both are, uh, some, I hate this statement in Spider-Man, you know, his girlfriend said, if you expect not to be, if you expect to be disappointed, you never will be. Said, wow, that's the perfect foundation for a pessimist. But always expect the worst, nothing will work out, and you'll never be disappointed. Because yes, you know, you protected yourself. And that's someone said, faith is spelled risk. Love is spelled risk, right? A lot of people say, I've been hurt, I loved, and I've been hurt too badly, I'm never going to love again. And so they build this wall that protects them from being hurt, but guess what? They build themselves to a prison. And they become a prisoner, in the wall that they built to protect themselves. So we need to know the love of God. We need to have a revelation of His love for us so that we will be free from fear or, or, or have less fear in our lives so that we can trust Him more, so that we will grow in being secure and less offendable. Less offendable. Because, you know, it's amazing how some people are easily offended by every little thing. And it's just too draining and time consuming and it's like, wow, it's just, why do you think that way? Why do you always see things in the worst possible way? How do we perceive things? And, again, and, and, and lastly, the last area is, what are some blessing blockers of receiving the love of the Father? Two, there are probably more, but here are two key ones. Okay, we know we need to grow in God's love so that we are known by Him, we are known by our fruit, so that the world will know his, we are His disciples. Thirdly, so that we are protected from fear, protected from being offended or causing offense because of fear and insecurity. But here's the final thing this morning. What are two key blessing blockers to the Father's love? And um, I think two key areas are that often hinder the love we walk in is a lack of wisdom or foolishness and pride. Okay, why, why do I say a lack of wisdom? Because many times we replace wisdom with love. In other words, we make foolish decisions because we think we are loving. And I learned this example by, by this evangelist from Germany who was decades in Africa. And he said, you know, when the elephant walked in the jungle, he saw these ostrich eggs that were left alone. Mother ostrich was nowhere to be found. And so this elephant was a very loving elephant. He started to weep tears of sadness and grief for these unattended 
ostrich eggs. And this mother, this, this elephant said, I'm going to show love. I'm going to help Mama Ostrich by incubating these eggs for her. And the elephant made scrambled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Great love, great sincerity, but no wisdom. And I've seen, personally, I've known people who made costly choices thinking they're walking in love. They thought, but the Bible says we love, this is loving. Hey, but it's foolish. Don't confuse love for foolishness. The foundation of love is wisdom. Okay, the enemy will take advantage of a lack of wisdom by making you on a good trip that if you don't do this, you're not loving. So we need to have wisdom. Now wisdom is not an excuse for not walking in love, or wisdom is the foundation that you are walking in the God kind of love. And the other area is pride. Pride can hinder us receiving the fullness of God's love. And I'm reminded of, of two, two stories in the Bible where people came, people had a need, but their pride was in the way. I'm sure you remember the story, Naaman, remember Naaman, who had leprosy. And the instruction of the prophet was, go dip yourself seven times in the river. And Naaman goes, how dare, don't they know who I am? Of all the rivers in Israel, why should I dip in this filthy river? Don't they know who I am? And the servant girl says, what's so hard about dipping yourself? What have you got to lose? But because of pride, he almost missed the blessing of being healed. And like as if the instruction for his healing deliberately provoked an area of his security. Was he going to be proud of his status, of who he was, that the river was too, too dirty? Said, okay, okay. He finally he gave in to the wisdom of his servant girl. And we all know what happened on the seventh dip. Isn't that amazing? The seventh time. Not the first time, not the second time. He could have got offended after the first time. What? I didn't see nothing happen. What? There's no change. There's no change. This is like the Jericho walls, right? No change in six marches. You could, you could assume that it'd be a gradual change with every dip. But after six times, still the same status quo. All of a sudden, sometimes, boom, heal. See, sometimes God does things progressively. Sometimes He does things immediately. And we've got to leave it to Him. But never assume He's not doing anything just because we don't see the gradual change. Sometimes it could be a suddenly after a long process of no change like the walls of Jericho like the seven times dipping right so he could have robbed himself of a miracle if he because of his pride now in the New Testament remember this Gentile lady whose daughter was possessed and, um, and this is let's, let's, let's look at the story this is in Matthew 15 okay Matthew 15 verse 22 it says, Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan, Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Look at this response, verse 23. But he answered her, not a word. Silence was a response. No response. He answered her, not a word. And the disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. Verse 24, But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25, Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, True, Lord. Wow. She could have said, How dare you call me a little dog? She agreed with him. Wow. True, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O oh woman, great is your faith. And you can kind of replace the word faith with humility. Great is your faith that you were not offended by my lack of response in comparing me to a little dog. Great is your faith, like Naaman, who was not too proud to obey and dip seven times. Great is your faith, let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very um, remember the first miracle when they ran out of wine what did Jesus what did Mary ask him in John chapter 2 verse 3 he gave her the problem he gave her the need he said you know they're, they're out of wine look we need wine do something about it and what was his response to his own mother it says verse 3 they, when they ran out of wine the mother of Jesus said to him they have no wine in verse 4 Jesus said to her woman what does your concern have to do with me? My time is not yet come. 
Wow. That doesn't sound very loving to me. Is that love? I mean, to call her woman and to say, what is your concern? She could have said, how dare you call me woman? I'm your mother. She said, mom. Mom. Because you're my mother, your concern is mine. <laughs> but guess what? He was now in public ministry. His seat was shifted. He was now, his primary concern was not his mother's concern, but his father in heaven's concern. So number one, obligation to please or to, he said, I came to do my father's will, not my mother's will. But she probably didn't realize the shift had happened. <coughs> and it was more about purpose, just like the Canaanite woman. He said, I was not sent to the lost, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not to you Gentile. And isn't that amazing? Because for three years, Jesus didn't prioritize the Gentiles. He came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jews who were, who, who were unbelievers. He was reaching out to them. And the Gentiles would have to wait till after he went up and the Spirit came down and the disciples and the apostles would reach out to the Gentiles beginning with Cornelius. And you wonder, wow, isn't that kind of unloving? But you see, Jesus was, was led by the Father, by his purpose, and not driven by every need. Because you can think about it, you know, Jesus started ministry at the age of 30. So for 30 years, he did not heal a single sick person. He didn't cast out a single devil. He did no miracle for 30 years. And then he only ministered for three years, only with 12 disciples. And then not only, not to everybody, but just to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And it can seem very unloving. His response to Mary could seem very unloving, but Mary was not offended. What did she do? He said, well, the next best thing I can do is tell the servants and expect an instruction from him. And he, she turned around to the servant and says, you need to do whatever he tells you to do. In other words, I think a light bulb went on. He's not going to do what I tell him because I'm his mom. But if you believe, you'll do what he tells you to do. And so, what could have hindered the miracle of Naaman? What could have hindered the miracle of the water to wine? What could have hindered the miracle of the daughter of the Canaanite woman? It was offense or of pride. And sometimes, you know, the word of God says, a broken and a contrite spirit will not despise. <coughs> Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. In other words, Jesus came not for the healthy but for the sick who recognize they need help and who trust Him and believe in Him to help them. He didn't come to those who have no need, who don't need God, they got everything all together, they got their act together, they're perfect, they're self sufficient. Okay, fine, carry on. You have no need. And sometimes, the, 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 the risk of being blessed materially and financially is nothing wrong with it. The risk is our material possession can blind us to our spiritual poverty. That's what Revelation says. You say you're rich, you say you have no need, but spiritually, inwardly, you're blind, naked and poor. And so the prodigal son had no revelation of his spiritual state till he lost everything. And then he came to sense, hey, I have a good dad. I can go home. He's going to accept me. But the elder brother never had a revelation because he never had a need. And so his security was misplaced and having all his needs met, he didn't realize what a good father he had. And so we want to know the love of our Father in heaven. We got to recognize and realize, hey, if not for his love, we are nothing. If not for him, we have nothing. And it is his grace that he gives us what we can do to be blessed. It is by his grace we are healthy, we are favored with our employer, our companies, or whatever we do that our, the work of our hands prospers is by his grace. It's by circumstances beyond our control. We didn't choose when and where we were born and, uh, and, and where we went to school or the family we were in. But by God's grace, He trusted us to put in a situation beyond our control so that we could be blessed one day. And so we got to recognize the end of it all is all by Him and for Him. But we are just, say so thank you Lord for the grace to be a good steward of what you gave me that I can study because you gave me a good mind. I'm smart because it's your grace, you know. It's like look at all the, ch all the families who got children with challenges or autistic who got downs. I mean they didn't choose, who knows why. You know, and, um, and so we've got to be thankful and say, Father, give me a revelation of your love. So lastly, how do we grow in the Father's love? There's some practical things we can do and we're going to close with this. Why do we need to know the love of the Father? Because that's how we are known. We're not known by good works alone. We need to know the love of the Father so that we be recognized as his disciples. We need to grow in the Father's love so that we'll be less easily provoked, less offendable, less fear in our lives, more peace. And lastly, we've got to guard our hearts that we don't 
get easily offended because of pride and rob ourselves of a blessing. Because someone said many times, God will offend the mind to reveal the heart. And I think maybe that's why God chose fishermen. Have you wondered why God chose fishermen? He should have gone, or we would have gone to the synagogue and asked for the top students. I'm looking for disciples. Give me your best um, apprentices. I'm looking for disciples to follow me. Who are the smartest guys you have? Now, Jesus didn't go to the synagogue to look for disciples. He went to the beach. Now, being Jews, they probably had some knowledge of the Torah, of the Old Testament. Every Jew had to be raised in that, trained by their dad and mom. But the focus was not on the head so much, but the heart, because if your heart is teachable, your head can change. If your heart is teachable, you become dogmatic and opinionated and an offense to everybody. God is looking for a humble and a contrite people who are willing to be moldable and shapeable to recognize, hey, why am I getting offended? Am I offended for the right reason? Lord, forgive me. I repent of the sin of pride. I don't want to rob myself of a blessing. Why am I fearing this? Father, forgive me for not trusting you. I don't have to fear. You're my good dad. You have something good in store. If what I thought was the best plan for me doesn't work out, I trust you that you have a better plan. And sometimes when we don't understand why God allows certain things, we assume that uh, I'm going to end up with something worse. Maybe it's something better and your plan for yourself was not good enough. Why do we always assume the worst of God? It seems the best and you'll be less disappointed. So how do we grow in the Father's love? Well, number one, we need to pray. It's word on growing in His love. You want to know a wonderful prayer of growing in the Father's love in Ephesians 3. Paul prayed this in the, in the letter to the church of Ephesus. Ephesians 3 verse 17. It says, May Christ dwell in our hearts through faith, that we being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ. The word know is genosco, which means to know by experience. To know, to experience the love of Christ which passes head knowledge without experience. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay, so that's a wonderful prayer, Ephesians 3. That should be our daily prayer. Lord, may you dwell in my heart to faith that I may be rooted and grounded in love that fear has no room in me, that I won't be easily offended, that pride will not block the blessings, that I can comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to experience your love, that passes knowledge, as John the Beloved did, that I may be filled with all the fullness of God. What's another way? Confess 1 Corinthians 13. Thank you, Jesus, your love is in me, therefore I am patient. I'm growing in patience. I'm growing in kindness. Have you noticed this? Whenever you're impatient, you become unkind with your words. Right? When you're waiting for someone too long and you're just frustrated. How many times must you make me wait? Yo, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right? Unkindness is the reaction to impatience many times. So it's amazing that, that the order of words, the first thing of love is patient. Hey, because that patience has its perfect work. And when you grow in patience, you'll be less unkind with your words. You know, and be careful what you pray for. Right? I heard that someone praying, Lord, give me patience right now. Oh, no. oh, you're praying for patience? Okay, I'll make sure all the lights are red. <laughs> I get all the time lights red. Didn't you pray for patience? I'm teaching you to wait. Hey, oh, thank you, Lord. You know, turn, turn your frustration to an opportunity. Yes, I pause. But I'm going to praise you now. Before the lights are green, I'm going to make some confessions. I'm going to thank you for what you've given me. What the enemy means for evil, <laughs> turn it for good. Right? So speak is what I say. I'm patient because... the the Father's love is in me, I'm kind, I'm not easily provoked, I keep no record of wrongs, I'm not rude. Confess the word over here, the bread we put in our mouths. Right? Because word is meant to be in our hearts and our mouths. Speak the word, pray the word, and lastly, pray in the Spirit. Jude chapter 1 verse 20. The second last book of the New Testament. Jude 1 20 says, But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God. Well, wow. He's not going to do our job for us. You've got to keep yourself in His love. You know, it's not something I can pray for you, God. Make them all living. That's not going to work. Okay, it, it, it's a work in progress. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So how do we keep ourselves in the love of God? You've got to pray in the Holy Spirit. Build yourself up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. You know why? Last verse. The answer is in Father Romans 5.5. 5. Romans 5.5 5 says, 
Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So how do we have the love of God in, in our hearts? It's been poured out by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, pray in the Holy Spirit. The more you pray in the language of the Holy Spirit, you're allowing the love of the Father to be shed abroad in your heart so that you'll find a change in yourself in the areas that do not reflect His love. Because at the end of the day, we can't walk in unity without love. Because people are going to offend you. And, and the most common offense is the offense of unmet expectations. And, and the hard thing about expectations is you don't know what they are till they're not met. Right? And so when someone doesn't meet your, your unspoken, unwritten expectation, you think, oh, they should have done that. Why did they do that? Well, I'm offended now. Right? And so offenses will come. And so you're going to say, Lord, help me overcome this. Help me not be so provoked. Don't, don't, don't grab, you know, some people love looking for battles to fight. Don't waste your energy. Choose your battles wisely. Overlook it. At the end of the day, how is this offense going to impact your life next month? If it's not, forget it. Overlook it. It's not worth fighting over. It's not worth losing your peace over. Prioritize your relationship more than the issue. You see, in insecure, fearful people would rather win an argument than guard the unity of spirit. They are so insecure that they will have to win everything at the cost of the relationship are necessary. But when your security is in a child of God, Father, you love me, I can lose this argument. It's, I'm not, my security is not on your opinion of me. Okay, my security is in the Father's opinion of me. He loves me. It doesn't matter what man thinks of me. I know, Father, you love me. I don't know why you love me. I don't have to prove anything to anyone. I don't have to impress anybody. I'm secure in your love. And so when you're secure in Father's love, you're no longer running around. You can't please everybody. You can't make everybody happy. So we need to pray the word, speak the word, pray in the Holy Spirit, and when you're tested and tempted, let the word come to mind. Say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm feeling offended now. Help me. Grace, grace. What do I do now? Tell him your struggles. Talk to him. And he will come through. Because that's his heart. He wants the world to see that his love is in you. He wants the world to know that you're his disciples by your love. He wants you to be free from fear and insecurity. He wants you to be secure in him. He wants you to walk in unity. Where does where does um, um, love begin? As I said, charity begins in the house. And so the second, the new commandment is love one another as as I have loved you. You know why? Because not many people love themselves. So if we limit our love to as I love myself. What do you do with people who hate themselves, who can't forgive themselves? They just rejected themselves. They've never they feel they're worthless, they're useless. They're never good enough. And so they never love anyone else. So God says, "Oh, you're not the standard. My love for you is." Love one another as I love you because your love for yourself is not good enough. You fail in that area. So, and the other problem is we sometimes we love ourselves too much. <laughs> we become the center of the world. So God says, no, no. His standard for us is love. And for those who are married, love the one another begins with your spouse. Do you know what Peter 3, 7 says? If we don't treat our wives with understanding, our prayers will be hindered. You realize that? This is the word for all husbands and husbands to be. You don't believe me? Turn, look at it yourself. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Towards the end of the New Testament. Okay, let me read it. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. Okay, this is not about in the wrong way. Okay, this is probably a verse that feminists hate. It's as a help me, I guess. Give give honor to the wife as weaker vessel as being heirs together of the grace of life. Why? That your prayers, husband, may not be hindered. Wow. So you husbands, God with understanding, honor your wife, because you're heirs together the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. You know, often I don't know how many have caught this, but when I when I read about Eve taking a bite. Nothing seemed to happen, but when Adam took a bite of the fruit, then both their eyes were open. Because God gave Adam the instruction on Eve. He instructed Adam before Eve came around. So it was Adam's responsibility to instruct Eve. So the key was kind of still the covering. So she could have, if he didn't bite, I wonder how the outcome would have changed. He said, Eve, why did you bite that fruit? You shouldn't have. I'm not going to eat that. Who knows what would have happened? But the fact that he also ate, then both their eyes were open. So we need to grow in the revelation of the Father's love. We need to be secure in His love. You know why you're loved? Because you're His child. Nothing you do can make God love you more. 
right? Think about your own children. Is your love for your kids based on their performance, their behavior, their grades? No, you love them because they're your children. Obviously, they're still dependent on you. That you're not going to withhold food or drink or clothing or kick them out of the house because they didn't obey your every command, because they provoked you, upset you. The foundation of love is relationship. Why? So that when we appreciate the Father's love, that motivates us to grow Christ-likeness. So that's, that's the key. Serve, love God, love others, serve one another. We can't love, we don't know His love. We will have fear, we don't know His love. We'll be easily offended, we don't know His love. We'll be insecure, we don't know His love. We'll forever be offended, we don't know His love. We can't afford not to know His love. Freely you received, freely give. So I rather sing, you love me, Lord, and I lift my voice. You know the old song, I love you, Lord. I said, no, we don't really love him as we should. But we can sing by faith. Just like the other song, you know, I surrender all. I forget to sing that. Okay, Lord, I'm trying to surrender more. <laughs> I'm not going to think I surrender all, but I don't. Yes, I'm, I'm willing to lay it down. And so we got to make this, may this be our prayer, because we'll all be challenged in these areas. I'm challenged in these areas. We will never arrive at being like Christ. We will never arrive at, now I'm the most humble person. Now I'm the most loving person. No, you'll be tested every day with the different situations that come up. So when you're tested, when you're provoked, make the choice. The Father, I run to you, I need your love. I humble myself, I choose not to get offended. I want your grace and see what God will do. Let's stand together.